Once again, thank you for joining tonight's District 2 community meeting. My name is Monica Leon and I'm a public affairs specialist here at the police department. Tonight our meeting is currently in the webinar format and we will be utilizing the Q&A box to answer any questions throughout the presentation. For all the questions that we do not answer, we will have a segment at the end of the presentation to answer these. Before we get started, I would like to ask Councilmember Jones if he would like to say a few words before handling off to Chief Washington. Councilmember? Thank you, Monica. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, I can't see everybody, but you know, I'm looking forward to the day that we get out of these little boxes and get back to meeting in person. Uh, I think it's just so much more productive and, and so much more friendly. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, introduce you to our new police chief. For those of you who have not met him, uh, Chief Sean Washington took over the department on October 1st last year. Um, he is following in a tradition of our, our former chiefs. We have a saying at the police department, a tradition of excellence. And I have had the pleasure of working with Sean, uh, well did for about eight years before I retired. Um, and I have always found him to be incredibly intelligent and fair handed and just one of those people you could never really get to. Um, you know, he always kept his cool and uh, he has been an incredible asset to our department. I am, I am very, very proud that we have him as uh, our department chief now. And uh, Sean, before I make you blush, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Councilmember Jones. I do appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Uh, I am super excited about uh, having the opportunity to engage with you all tonight. Uh, these meetings are important uh, as I uh, settle in to my new role uh, and, and um, to serve all of you. Uh, it's important to hear uh, some of the uh, priorities and objectives and just feedback um, from all of you. Uh, I will be sharing some information on um, you know, our city as a whole, but then also through your council member, uh, we wanted to also address some specific concerns related to your district. So I look forward to taking you all through that, but we have a special um, treat tonight where we have um, Susan Shin Suzanne Shinfield, uh, who is here to talk a little bit about HomeKey. This is a, a unique opportunity for us to share a little bit of information regarding uh, this project and where we are and, and those type of things. So uh, before we get started into the, the district meeting, I do wanna turn it over to Suzanne, allow her to introduce herself and her role for those of you who do not know Suzanne and talk a little bit about uh, Project Home Key um, so that you have the information as we move forward. So with that, Suzanne, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chief, I appreciate it. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Suzanne Chantville and I am the city's human services director. And we provide many of the social services uh, for the city of Fremont. Tonight, I wanna to talk a little bit about our Home Key project and tell you about it. Um, the city has recently applied to the state of California for $40 million to convert the Motel 6 on Research Avenue into 156 units of permanent affordable housing with supportive services on site. Addressing homelessness is really one of the city council's highest priorities. In the last couple of years, the city has worked on the problem of homelessness by opening a new housing navigation center, which is located in the lot adjacent to city hall and is working to help place people into permanent housing. And we've also recently launched a safe parking pilot program for those living in non-recreational vehicles. But neither of these programs provides permanent affordable housing. And that's the biggest challenge we face in addressing homelessness. The lack of housing units that are affordable to those which are acutely low income. And that means that they earn 15% of median income or less. During COVID, the state developed a $1.5 billion home key program as a way to quickly and cost-effectively move unsheltered people 
off of the street and into permanent affordable housing through hotel conversions and other innovative approaches. HomeKey provides a unique opportunity to secure state funding to address homelessness here in Fremont. After reviewing proposals for four hotels, um, which were available for conversion, staff recommended council approve an application to the state to purchase the Motel 6 site and turn it into affordable housing. Tenants will pay rent based on their incomes, as do tenants in all of our affordable housing units throughout the city. The city is proposing to work with a developer from Los Angeles called Shangri-La that has a lot of experience in doing these types of motel conversion projects. And they partner very closely with an organization called Step Up, which will not only manage the apartments, but also provide supportive services. Step Up has managed 15 similar projects across the United States, and they have a very great track record of retention, which means that um, for all tenants who move into Step Up Housing, 97%, even those who have been previously homeless are still housed after one year. If the city's grant is successful, and we hope it will be, the conversion of the hotel rooms into studio apartments will need to be completed within one year. Once residents move in to the project, Step Up will provide a number of on-site supportive services to allow people to be successful in their new housing arrangement. The services that will be offered will include helping people with independent living skills, job training, food programs, transportation, substance abuse and mental health treatment, um, representative payee services, which is helping people manage their bank accounts and their money if they're not able to do that. And also community building and tenant activities um, that will allow the participants to uh, really create a supportive community. The city has heard concerns from a number of residents regarding the potential for crime uh, to increase if the home key application is successful. So I know that Chief Washington has some thoughts on this point, and I'm going to turn it back over to him now so he can share his thinking about the project and also get on with the rest of his agenda. Thank you, Chief, for allowing me to give this brief presentation. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. And uh, thank you for that information. I do think it's important for our communities to have that information. And, and I know there are concerns about uh, public safety and these type of projects. I will tell you that uh, I am very supportive of anything that helps uh, get um, individuals that are seeking housing into housing because typically uh, we've seen the associate, association between uh, folks who don't have access to these type of projects and, and crime. Uh, we respond to um, those type of incidents that are folks who don't have housing and are out there on the streets. So uh, we, we found that to be true um, with some of these um, uh, situations with our unhoused population. Although this isn't, isn't a true homeless shelter, um, we know that it plays a role in getting people affordable housing and, and them not having to resort to living on the street. Um, the bulk of our calls for service have to do with individuals that are living on the street. We know that. The bulk of the criminal activity that's associated with uh, some of uh, members of our unhoused uh, population has to do with folks who are living on the street as well. So we typically don't have a lot of calls for service at facilities, either low income housing or homeless shelters. Um, we typically don't get a lot of calls for service to those facilities. We also uh, make sure that we are supportive as a police department at these facilities by ensuring that um, we don't allow uh, encampments or criminal activity to start to take place. 
So we, mon we, we do extra monitoring and patrols of these uh, facilities to ensure its success as well. So from the public safety perspective, I do think it's um, in our best interest to support and um, have some of these uh, projects move forward um, because the more folks we can get into affordable housing or shelters, I think the uh, more safety and security we'll, we will have ultimately on our streets. So anyway, I just want to share my perspective on that. I do, uh, I've talked to other chiefs throughout the region and they, they kind of share the same uh, philosophy on these things. It's not gonna cure all of the issues that we're dealing with as it relates to our unhoused population, but I do think it is a step in the right direction and it will help not hurt. Um, so anyway, with that perspective, we'll, we'll, we'll move on into the um, presentation and we'll go to the next slide and we'll, we'll have a meeting overview. We've already done the introductions, but I will say that I am fortunate to be joined here today by uh, my wonderful staff. We have manager Kennedy who oversees our uh, intelligence and data analysis unit. We have uh, members of our community engagement uh, unit as well, uh, Amy G and Monica Leon. And then we have some IT support with Leveling Car as well. So they all have dedicated their time today to make this uh, presentation successful. One of the things that I'm gonna talk about just really briefly uh, because it is out there online is my transition plan and the goals embedded in that plan. And that's gonna to relate to some of, the, uh, some of the data and initiatives that you're gonna see later. I'm gonna provide a crime update and then as was stated, we'll have time at the end for questions and we will be able to provide some answers. Next slide. So again, uh, the transition plan, hopefully uh, you all are aware that uh, I produced a transition plan at, shortly after um, being named as the police chief. And I identified six major uh, goals that are embedded in the plan. These goals were produced uh, as a result of a lot of uh, public interaction and community engagement. So although it is the chief's transition plan, it really was founded on uh, some of the comments that I received from our community. One of, the thing that, one of the things that we're gonna do is enhance community relationships uh, by building trust and police legitimacy. And there's a whole host of ways in which we're gonna accomplish that. We're gonna assess organizational effectiveness and efficiency. So it's important for us to do that because we have a limited amount of resources. So we have to make sure that we are deploying those resources in a very effective and efficient manner. We're also gonna conduct a comprehensive review of our policies and procedures. That's important as well because it's how we deliver service to our community that's gonna make the most difference. So we wanna make sure that our policies and procedures align with best practices. We wanna provide better staffing uh, and that's through uh, how we recruit, who we recruit and why we recruit certain individuals. And then we wanna support professional development, training and education. And all of this is geared towards our ability to deliver the highest level of professional service to all of you. We then want to increase internal communication because it's important for communication of our goals and objectives to be uh, provided to our staff so they understand the mission, the purpose, and why we serve. And we can do that uh, and support our employees with team building and ensuring that they are well uh, and supported physically, mentally, financially, and all those things that we know will support the uh, employee wellness. And then finally, we wanna build city uh, partnerships and be supportive of city initiatives like Suzanne just talked about. Uh, homelessness and our unhoused population, that is not solely a police issue. In fact, um, it's only an issue when it becomes a crime. Uh, it is a bigger problem that requires the cooperative work of many, many uh, different service providers and departments throughout the city um, to help mitigate the impact of our unhoused population. So that is an example of working together with other city uh, departments to accomplish um, community service objectives. Next slide. So we'll get into uh, some of the statistics and a little bit of an update on where we are. 
Um, it's important to note that the data is from uh, 2021, unless we uh, otherwise note um, that the data is from a different time. Uh, we'll start with uh, my biggest concern and a trend that I uh, am watching very closely, and that has to do with violent crime. So our shooting incidents and firearm arrests, um, as you can see, has trended up. In 2020, we had 19 shooting incidents, and we had 44 firearm-related uh, arrests. In 2021, we had 41 shooting incidents and 62 firearm-related arrests. Now, with violent crime, uh, that is our top priority. We know that that has a significant impact on our communities. So our goal is to investigate and reduce shootings and gun crimes. We focus on quick apprehension efforts to prevent additional incidents. And uh, early in 2021, when we started to notice that there was an uptick in shooting incidents and firearms-related crimes, we formed the Gun Violence Reduction Team. And so that is a team of experts with special skills in de-escalation, in investigation, and deterrence that come together to try to mitigate the impact of our shootings and violent crime. So we made 20 arrests uh, utilizing that team. And um, you know, that was a direct response to the increase of shooting incidents uh, over the year, um, the past year. Now it's important to note that these statistics, while uh, concerning, they really align with what we've experienced in the entire region and the country. You just turn on the news and you will see that there has been increases in these types of um, incidents throughout our country and our region. And unfortunately, it has impacted Fremont as well. One um, thing that I failed to mention before I got started is I'm going to talk about statistics in a way that I may say, uh, you know, we, we remain the same or we had an increase or decrease. But I want you all to realize that each of these crimes is associated with a person. So I don't want to come across like I'm diminishing the importance or the impact of these crimes because every single statistic, data point, or number represents a real human being. So I don't want that to be lost in this conversation as I make some of these comparisons. Next slide. All right, now, so homicide and serious assault. Uh, as you can see, uh, we had one more homicide than we did uh, the, the previous year in 2020. So we went from two to three. We've held steady over the last couple of years and we're usually right around uh, two or three. Now, again, this is one of those stats that we're talking about someone losing their, their, their life, right? And so uh, I want that stat to be zero for sure. Um, but again, when we compare ourselves to cities, uh, our size throughout the state and us being the fourth largest city in the Bay Area, you know, this homicide rate is relatively low. Again, with all due respect to the folks who did lose their lives, um, it is relatively low when we compare ourselves to other cities and other jurisdictions. But I do want that number to be zero. Um, so serious assaults uh, and attempted homicides, as you can see, there's been an uptick there as well. And again, violence being the number one priority for our police department, we're monitoring that uh, closely. With the homicides last year, uh, it's important to, um, uh, uh, for me to communicate that all of our homicides were resolved by arrest. So there, there are no uh, unsolved, uh, unsolved homicides out there from 2021. Next slide. Robberies, uh, as you can see, the trend has been uh, in the right direction in a downward trend. Uh, we were pretty much held steady from 2020 to 2021. Uh, I'd like to see that number uh, go down, but you know, some of what we've done to try to mitigate uh, the impact of this crime is utilizing quick response um, and thorough investigation and, and sub leading to subsequent uh, apprehension. Our collaboration with outside agencies to share regional suspect information is also key. We understand that there is a small portion of our society that typically is responsible for the most crime. So going after those individuals is critical to our success utilizing uh, intelligence-led policing principles. 
Next slide. Burglaries, uh, as you can see, uh, have been trending down over the last uh, couple of years, uh, especially residential burglaries. We're from 2017 to 2021, we've had a steady uh, decrease. Uh, commercial burglaries, though, however, um, we saw a spike in 2020, and then uh, we saw a decrease in 2021. Now, in 2020, you might ask yourself, what was going on? Well, that was at the height of COVID, right? So a lot of our commercial businesses shut down. And we know that a lot of these crimes are crimes of opportunity. So the criminals, knowing that uh, the businesses were not occupied, used that as an opportunity to commit these crimes. As we started to come out of COVID just a little bit and people started to get back to work, we started to see the trend um, going uh, down. And so I would imagine that as we more people get back into the office, back into the warehouses and those type of things, I think this trend will continue to go in a downward uh, trajectory. Um, and then vehicle, um, vehicle, sorry, I'm trying to get my screen right here. Uh, yeah, so vehicle, um, vehicle burglaries. Uh, that, that trend has been going down as well, and it has continued. So we, we saw a pretty significant decrease uh, from 2020 to 2021. And uh, really, some of the strategies that we utilized was high visibility patrols being utilized as deterrents. So um, Manager Candidate will talk about uh, some of these statistics, but really her group has been charged with directing us and directing our resources into areas that are considered hotspots and uh, conducting high, visibil high visibility patrols to try to mitigate the impact of these crimes. We also focus, like I said before, on repeat offenders, knowing that there's a small portion of our society that's responsible for the majority of these crimes. And then what makes Fremont um, still a relatively safe uh, city is the fact that we're able to get cooperation from our community members and utilize technology to help solve and deter some of these crimes. Next slide. So auto theft, um, as you can see, uh, uptick uh, trending in the wrong direction here. So um, we did have an increase from 2020 to 2021. Again, many of them are repeat offenders. Um, we're trying to utilize the technology that we have to uh, put a dent in uh, these type of crimes. Now, one of the things to uh, consider is that uh, during COVID, there were some changes in our ability to hold or arrest and physically take uh, criminals into custody. So especially with auto theft, um, there could and there were scenarios in which we would stop and arrest an individual for uh, auto theft or stealing a vehicle. And we were unable to hold or take that person into custody. We, we basically had to issue them a citation and release them back into our communities. You can imagine the impact that that had. Uh, a lot of repeat offenders and those type of things. So I think as we start to get out of COVID, uh, those type of things will start to be reversed. Uh, a lot of the reasoning for that was overpopulation in our jails and those type of things and concerns about spreading uh, the COVID, um, uh, uh, spreading COVID throughout our jails and into our society. So I'm hopeful that uh, some of those uh, decisions will start to be reversed and we can uh, um, start having a little bit more consequence to uh, these type of uh, criminals. Next slide. Grand theft. Um, big jump from 2020 to 2021. We think the increase had a lot to do with the catalytic converters uh, uh, thefts, and you guys are probably well versed on the, the uh, impact that those have had on not only this community, but uh, nationally, the impact that these crimes have had. Uh, we have averaged about 67 thefts per month, which is significant. And um, yeah, our investigations are continue to focus on secondhand dealers and recyclers. And we really have to rely on our regional partners and in, in, in sharing information because oftentimes what we found is these individuals will come into Fremont and they will work their way up the 680 or 880 corridor and go from city to city conducting these um, criminal acts. 
And so it's more of a regional issue than uh, an issue specific to Fremont, but it, it, it does have its impact. So um, anyway, we are monitoring that and trying to make some adjustments on how to mitigate uh, those crimes. Next slide. Some sideshow activities. So if you don't know what a sideshow is, it's basically illegal driving, taking over of a street, doing tricks in the cars and donuts. And uh, oftentimes it's associated with violence. Um, so in 2020, we saw a little bit of a spike in this activity, but we really, I think, able to make an impact because we started to more closely work with our regional partners, dedicate resources here internally, utilizing overtime, and specialty units to try to mitigate uh, the impact that this was having. So some of the strategies were just anticipating and using intelligence to try to anticipate where the, this activity might occur and uh, being very visible in areas that we know are prone to this type of activity. So we have seen a downward um, trend in this type of activity and we hope that that continues uh, going forward. Next slide. All right, so homeless disturbance calls for service and uh, mental, uh, uh, mental um, illness detentions that we have, which we call 5150s. So uh, I'll start with homeless disturbance calls. And you might notice in 2018, we had uh, 1,151 calls and then it jumped up to 3,545. Well, it's important to understand in 2018 is when we first started to collect this data. So it's incomplete data in 2018 uh, and we weren't tracking it like we did uh, do now. But as you can see in 2019, we started to track the data more consistently and then 2020, and there's been a slight trend uh, downward, although it's held pretty steady. We average about nine homeless disturbance calls per day uh, for 2020 to 2021. Now our 5150 reports, uh, we think that that de decrease has been uh, linked to our enhanced officer training. So we, we provided more training to our officers. And then I think our MET team has really contributed to uh, the downward trend in these 5150 calls. And that's because uh, our MET unit, our police officers are partnered with clinicians that have expertise and will follow up on some of these folks that we are interacting with and provide them the services that they need so that we don't have uh, as many repeat clients and repeat um, um, calls for service to these individuals. So next slide. Now, then I want to talk about a little bit about uh, hate crimes and as you can see on the chart from 2020 to 2021, we have had an increase from four to seven. We still are relatively steady in the number of hate crimes that we've had, but it's important to understand that the significance of these crimes uh, have a severe impact on our community. So, um, you know, the seven that we had, those are seven individuals and seven victims that uh, has been impacted by these crimes that we take very seriously. Of the seven that we had, three were anti-religion and four were anti-race. And it's important for me to kind of make the, um, uh, differentiate um, a hate crime from a hate incident. So understanding a hate crime is against a person, group, or property um, motivated by the victim's real or perceived protected social group. And that could be a disability, gender, gender, nationality, race, ethnicity, those type of things. And so hate crimes are serious crimes that may result in imprisonment or jail time. And that's different from a hate incident. And a hate incident is an action or behavior motivated by hate, but which for one or more reasons is not a crime. Name calling, insult, displaying hate material, um, putting up posters on your own property, uh, distribution of uh, hate material. Those are not crimes. However, it's important to understand that they have still a high impact on the individuals that they uh, affect. So although it's not criminal activity, we still take it very seriously and we document those uh, situations. Next slide. All right, now uh, we are fortunate to be joined, uh, or she's been here the whole time, our um, manager candidate. 
who would go over some data specific to your district. So working with uh, your council member, uh, we wanted to address some data specific to your district, knowing that you reside, live, or work in this particular area. And it's important for you to have a complete understanding of the type of crimes and incidents that are impacting your particular area. So with that, I'll turn it over to manager candidate. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you see some stats and a map on the page, I'd just like to walk you through it. Um, this map is a typical traditional crime analysis map. Um, it's a heat map of documented reports in your district in Fremont. So the, the red areas aren't necessarily crime. It's the, the volume of police reports ha has created um, those, those red areas um, of volume. And so, uh, you know, many of these reports, again, are not crime. They are reports for things they include crime, but they are also miscellaneous public service, found property, suspicious circumstances, traffic accidents, et cetera. So really everything that gets documented in a formal report is, is represented on um, this map. And so we, we often call these also hotspots. So we'll refer to hotspots a bit. And those are areas, small geographic areas where crime is committed um, frequently enough that it is predictable. So it's these areas that we really pay attention to and analyze and uh, deploy extra resources to. So actually in district two, um, we don't have a lot of significant hotspots. Uh, the two primary ones are Maori Farwell, those shopping areas, um, commercial retail areas often drive crime uh, to include auto burglary, theft. Um, th those are the primary ones. And then also Brookville Shopping Center sees some activity, Fremont, Dakota. And again, it's, it's the, the commercial areas where um, we see most of our crime in District 2. So if you'll look to the left, this uh, table here shows a comparison of last year, 2021 to 2020. There were no homicides in your district. Our robberies uh, did increase. Uh, the percentage looked significant. We had 27. So the breakdown that uh, makes up those robberies are home invasions where uh, your district had none. Uh, there were three carjackings and 22 robberies, which could be uh, could include a weapon or just you know the what we call a strong arm, where someone uh, steals a cell phone off of a pedestrian, but they used force or, or fear in the taking of that phone. Um, so there are 27 robberies last year in your area. Residential burglary increased to 60. Um, I'd point out that actually 47 of those were homes broken into or attempted, and then 13 were garages, um, garages that were broken into often, you know, bike or tools are stolen from garage burglaries. We had a significant uh, decrease in commercial burglary. Um, and to, to jump down one also in auto burglary. And I would attribute this to some, some strategies that uh, the chief and command staff have supported, um, it, again, in targeting these commercial areas with extra patrol, um, use of you know, partnerships with our, uh, our retail centers, um, use of technology, et cetera. Uh, we've really focused in uh, the Maori Farwell in particular, that area. So uh, we've, we've seen some results for a decrease in commercial and auto burglaries. Auto theft remained basically unchanged. Um, grand theft, there was a significant increase, 197. As the chief explained, catalytic converter theft attributed significantly to the overall increase in this. Um, looking at the data in your district, approximately 130 reports of those 197 were catalytic converter thefts. Um, that, that would explain that jump. And then petty theft and mail theft, uh, virtually no change. The petty theft actually decreased, but there was an increase in mail theft 
Um, and mail theft was another trend we saw with COVID. And I, I would attribute in part to, um, you know, people seeking your uh, benefit cards or personal information in order to commit ID theft. Uh, we, we saw that type of activity these uh, during COVID. And then vandalism has decreased. Um, and overall reports, uh, again, these are the police reports I mentioned that uh, really document everything from found property, lost property, robbery, um, everything under the sun. So a slight increase in reporting. And then calls for service, you had a 14% increase. And I just like to explain calls for service. Um, these are documented incidents generated from 911 and non-emergency calls, as well as officers' self-initiated activity. So it includes calls from the public and then also officers' um, activity that they've initiated themselves. It might be pulling over in a shopping center to write a report, uh, using the bathroom at the fire station, uh, any type of activity generates a call for service. So not all calls for service are dispatched for a police response. Some callers are referred to our online system for particular crimes and other issues are determined to be non-criminal requiring no police response such as private tows or wireless 911 disconnects, et cetera. So again, there is a, there is a slight, uh, a bit of a jump there. The 415 homeless calls, again, the chief mentioned these, and these are disturbance calls. So it doesn't mean um, it's not comprehensive of everything related to um, an unhoused community member, but it, it was a call generated from the public, um, which often turns into a loitering call, um, trespassing, or you know something of that nature. And those increased in your district by 17%. And then proactive calls for service. Uh, this is uh, just a last note to mention. You had a very significant increase, uh, which is a great thing. This is the combination of three, primarily three call types. Um, it's ILP for intelligence-led policing, meaning the officers were utilizing analysis and intelligence to deploy themselves in these hot spots or responding to other um, concerns that were vetted through data and analysis. It also includes TSAT, which is our traffic saturation effort. And those are often also generated by um, community member complaints, requests, and data. TSAT is often done at high crash areas and our schools. So the officers will sit near the schools enforcing you know, traffic safety to keep the kids and their parents safe. And then lastly, um, it includes 1059s, which are our security checks. So, uh, you know, occasionally or, or actually regularly, a community member will call dispatch and say, you know, their house is being fumigated and they're concerned of burglary. So they'll do a, 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 an announcement, a post saying, um, you know, there's a request for extra patrol checks. Um, or you see suspicious activity in your neighborhood and you are just seeking extra patrol checks. So that's a security check. So um, in summary, those, you know, 83% of more proactive activity looking to uh, deter crime, solve problems, um, and, you know, increase the safety in those areas. And then I'll just quickly point out to the far right, top 10 reports. So whereas the left are the major crimes, uh, the right, these are looking at all the data in your district, your neighborhoods. These are the top reports. So um, various thefts, burglary, uh, 5150, suspicious circumstance. Again, this could be a neighbor just being very uncomfortable with a car that keeps driving past that they don't recognize. Um, vandalism, accidents, identity theft, and mail theft. That is all I have to share. Uh, Chief, if you want to take over. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, comment and follow up on a few more of, you know, your district specific uh, concerns or things that were brought to our attention uh, from your council member and and, and, and so gang graffiti uh, calls for service, 
Um, in 2020, we had uh, 18, 21, we had uh, 13, and so far this year, we've had two. So we, we have had, uh, we think, uh, we've implemented a lot of strategies to try to um, reduce the number of these type of incidents in that particular area. So we utilize our street crimes unit and our major crimes task force to help respond uh, to the, uh, particular areas that we know um, may be impacted by these um, crimes. Um, high visibility presence in uh, several investigations and follow-ups. Um, we've, we've made some arrests for assaults and weapons and drugs and vandalism and those type of things. So we just encourage that uh, the community's cooperation and involvement and if you're seeing activity in which you think is suspicious or might be gang related or tagging and those type of things, uh, we do have a, uh, a QR code here that you can um, access and leave anonymous tips to help us uh, respond to these, these crimes. So um, hopefully that trend will remain uh, in the right direction and through your assistance, with your assistance and uh, our strategies, I think we can really, really make a difference. Homeless disturbance call. So uh, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, citywide, there was 3,208. Your specific district had 378 calls, which equated to 12% of the total calls throughout the entire city. So the six, six districts, um, you had 12% of all the total calls. Now, um, there was an increase of about 17% of homeless disturbance calls in your district um, when compared uh, to 2020 to 2021. So again, uh, this is, and I'll talk about this. I see there's a question in the chat regarding homelessness. So we'll get to that in a, a moment, but, um, and I'll talk about some of the strategies that we have. Uh, Bill Ball Plaza, uh, the calls for service typically are um, municipal code violations, security checks, um, uh, disturbances and those type of things. We are aware of the encampments that are there on the uh, railroad property. So we do monitor that area as we can, uh, trying to prioritize this particular area with all the other areas in all the other districts throughout the entire city. So, um, you know, I, I, I know we try our best to get to all the areas throughout the city, but as you can imagine, doing all six districts uh, homelessness is a concern within all the districts, and uh, we try to do the best we can with what we have. And we know that there's an ongoing issue at Isherwood or Quarry Lakes, uh, the encampment there. So uh, ongoing and numerous uh, neighborhood complaints in which we take. We work with our city partners to try to prioritize and, and, and respond to some of these complaints. So we have responses from our MET team. Uh, human services, abode, and, and BACs, which are service providers. Um, and we conduct uh, regular outreach uh, using uh, the partnership with all of those uh, various uh, providers. Uh, most call for services in, in that area are security checks and, and disturbance calls. Uh, we had uh, 15 reports, uh, one assault, um, uh, follow-up, and then a couple of property crimes. Uh, the complexity of this area is, is it's multi-jurisdictional multi as well. Uh, East Bay Regional Park Police, uh, Union City shares a piece of this encampment and obviously uh, we have a portion as well. So we do work with those uh, other jurisdictions to try to come up with strategies on how to best respond uh, to uh, that situation. It is um, something that does require uh, more than just a police response. Again, I know uh, we are, we being the police department, uh, we are the convenient um, resource, but uh, we oftentimes are not the appropriate resource to deal with uh, this societal issue of homelessness because our, our, our response is limited. Uh, we can issue citations and make arrests all day long, but at the end of the day, uh, these individuals are still gonna be homeless. So they're just gonna be homeless with a citation or a notice to appear. And so the issue itself at its core and what I started this meeting with is that we, uh, we have to get people off the street and that goes beyond um, you know, just the police department having the ability to do that. So next slide. 
All right, here's some uh, resources and how you can stay connected with us. Um, and then I think the final slide is when we, all, we will open it up for questions and uh, I look forward to providing you some answers. All right, great. We have three questions currently um, pending. Here's the first one. Chief Washington, you have indicated that the bulk of calls that come to Fremont PD in, innate from the homeless population in the city. What will the department and the city be ready to provide statistics on the type of crime that have been observed? Um, this was a topic discussed during the March 8th city council meeting that needs closure. Yes, absolutely. And you are absolutely right that um, we, uh, we have been collecting that data. And the data is complex because it's more than just counting the number of calls. We have to dig into the data to really get a better understanding of what it means and the context behind it, because we really need to paint an accurate picture of what is actually occurring. So, so to, to answer your question, I think we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with our crime uh, analysis group to go over and review the, um, the data and then provide that data uh, to the community. So um, I, I know some of you, and it's not an excuse, but some of you know that we, we recently dealt with the tragedy here at the police department and we were having a lot of conversations about the data and, and trying to analyze it. And, and so we have been delayed uh, just a little bit um, because we had to take care of our uh, staff to deal with the recent tragedy that we experienced here at our police department. But we are back on, and I know that there is a meeting here, I believe tomorrow, to talk about that very topic. So um, stay tuned for that. All right. During COVID, the Tri-City Shelter has not been able to provide all services for a good part of the time. We still have no TNR services for the city and a number of the community cats have grown ex exponentially. What are your plans for bringing their staffing up and their level of need to order support to the city of our size? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And this was one of the things that I recently talked to my staff about. And it's essentially just uh, trying to make uh, priorities with the service that we provide to our community, knowing that animal services is a big priority for our community. I recently instructed my staff to make it a priority to get our staffing back up. So aggressively recruiting, uh, going out there and trying to get uh, staff that, uh, and this is a difficult, these are, these are difficult positions to recruit and hire for right now because every jurisdiction is, um, uh, seeking uh, qualified, competent employees. But we just had that conversation about making animal services a priority, and it is high on our priority list to ensure that the staffing gets to where it needs to be. To your point, uh, we are a relatively large uh, city, and we have to have the staffing to respond uh, effectively to these type of calls for service. So stay tuned for that. Uh, hopefully, we can get some, uh, we can make some progress on that uh, sooner than later. Okay. What is the plan to tackle the increased sleight of hand gypsy robbery from helpless seniors in the community, mostly Indian immigrant parents? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure I have the stats on uh, how many of these type of crimes that uh, we've had recently, but I do know one of the things that we try to do proactively is reach out to that particular segment of our community to provide education and information on how to best um, protect yourself from these type of crimes. So if you have a particular group or you're thinking about a particular neighborhood within your di district that will want some information or us to come and engage with them to try to provide that information, that is the first step um, because we really have to do this together, the community and the police. And we'll, we'll, we'll certainly respond and make arrests and do all those other sorts of things, but we need your help. And it starts with uh, information, education, and um, providing that information on how to best protect yourself. So we're happy to provide that service uh, if you're interested. Chief, can I add to that? Sure. Um, we also uh, have a coordinated regional response with detectives. We have a detective who's actively working this organization um, coordinating with detectives that, uh, you know, in other agencies, as well as our analysts. 
um, really committed to uh, protecting our vulnerable seniors that have been victimized by this. So it's definitely at the forefront. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, thank you for this comprehensive report. Could you please comment on any issues around attempted human trafficking within our district or Fremont overall? I have read some anecdotal reports of this happening in the Fremont hub, specifically in and outside of Target. Yeah, thank you for that. And I don't know if Joanna has any specific information on uh, statistics or crimes regarding human trafficking. Um, but I do know that we work closely with the district attorney's office and we will respond to any calls and conduct follow-up investigations on any suspicion of human trafficking. So, um, you know, those crimes are difficult to A, detect and then respond to because they're, they're, they're done in the shadows, obviously. And a lot of times these crimes are tied to a, a larger kind of network of, of criminals, right? That, that, that are, are, are beyond our borders here in Fremont. So we may have some crimes in Fremont, but it's tied to the, um, individuals who are operating out of say Southern California and they, they're operating out of multiple cities at the same time. So that's where our regional partnerships really comes into play and uh, we have to ensure that we um, uh, provide information and follow up in an effective manner utilizing those resources. So uh, jo Joanna, I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I don't know if you have any stats or information regarding these specific crimes. I don't have data, but just that one of our crimes against persons detectives it, it is dedicated to trafficking related issues um, and may, may have more information on this. Thank you. Okay, this looks like the last question that we have. My community sits between Peralta and the railroad tracks just east from Fremont Boulevard, which is just around the curve and out of sight of Fremont Boulevard. There have been two fires on the track side of the wall in the past two years. If there's any winds, our homes would have likely caught fire. The city said they cannot, will not do anything as people are living in the railroad right of way. But we live just on the other side. Can we, can, what can be done to keep us safe? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry that you had that experience. I'm not sure uh, who uh, communicated that we cannot or will not do anything um, because we do work with our partners quite a bit. And I know those conversations happen often. And, and although it may not be our jurisdiction, we do have cooperative relationships with uh, other jurisdiction and we will respond. If there's something like a fire or a hazard like that, we will respond. We don't care what jurisdiction is. Public safety will be a priority uh, regardless of what jurisdiction it is. We run, we run into this when we overlap with East Bay Regional Parks Police uh, all the time. And uh, we have a mutual agreement that if we see behavior or actions by individuals that pose an immediate and, and present danger to our community, it doesn't matter which law enforcement agency response, we have to go protect the community. So um, I do understand your frustration with that. I, I, I can kind of see where uh, maybe there was an explanation that it's, it's, it's not within our jurisdiction. So, you know, certain things like a cleanup or something like that, we may have limited ability to go in and clean it up, but we certainly can respond to criminal activity that is impacting our communities. And uh, that's certainly something that we do as a matter of routine. So. Look like one more question just popped up. Could we please comment on the crime red area bordered by Peralta Boulevard and Paseo Padre on the crime map? What are the crimes in that area? All right, I, I don't know if we can pull that back up or. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know offhand. Um, you know, I believe Monica is always available to you for follow up and we can look into that. Um, but just a reminder, this is not necessarily crime. It's also report. So it could be, uh, my, my guess, traffic accidents are part of it um, at Peralta. Uh, but um, we can look into that for you. OK, I think that's the last question. I'm just going to put my email in there for them to follow up. Okay, well, um, I, I do want to say thank you, everyone. I love this dialogue, this feedback. Um, I can um, promise you this is that all of this, all, this dialogue and, and the conversation 
we take very seriously. So we hear your concerns. We will do everything we can with the resources that we have um, to be responsive. We, I, I cannot promise that I'm gonna be able to solve all of the issues in our community and be able to respond to every issue that's out there, but I will give it fair consideration and do everything that we can um, to be responsive. So with that, I mean, I'm happy to turn it back over to uh, uh, Council Member Jones for any closing remarks or comments uh, before we conclude. Well, thank you, Chief. And again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I know this was a lot of information in a, in a short amount of time. Um, and again, these are things that, uh, you know, I think it's important that the police department share this information and be transparent about what their goals are, what their responses to these issues are. And, um, you know, going forward, I know that Chief Washington is, is going to be doing more outreach with the community, um, keeping everybody abreast of what's going on. It's, it's an incredibly complex time. It's been a very difficult time the last couple of years, particularly for law enforcement. Um, but you know, here in Fremont, our community supports our police department, and that's something that I'm really proud of. Um, you know, I, I think it has to do with the caliber of people that our department has a tradition of hiring, and obviously the caliber of our leadership. So you know, we've had a, a number of chiefs over the years that have brought things forward that um, have been requested in the last couple of years that we've actually been doing at our police department for more than 20 years. So, you know, Fremont has been a little bit ahead of a curve. And I think that that reflects on the community's interaction with our department. Um, again, we enjoy a lot of support from our community. And, you know, we try and do as much as we can with the resources that we have, as Chief Washington said, um, and a lot of that is driven by the analysis that Manager Kennedy provides. Um, you know, this intelligence-based policing is, is kind of a somewhat newer trend, but it's been extremely effective in going after the, the worst of the worst. And I think that's what our department focuses on. Um, but, you know, we have such an incredible organization um, and I, I'm proud of all of our city employees, and I may be a little bit biased towards the police department, sorry, but um, given my career there. Uh, but, you know, I know the caliber of people that we have, and I know their interaction with the community and their commitment to this community. And so I hope that all of you will continue to support uh, the police department as it goes forward. And, you know, any questions that you have, as, as Monica said, her email is in there. Um, you know, it's basically an open door. Uh, you, you can never be afraid to ask questions. You'll never know the answer until you actually ask. So again, Chief, thank you for uh, giving up some of your time, Joanna and Monica and Amy hiding behind the badge there. Um, but, uh, you know, I know this is incredibly important to our community. And again, I think we have um, an extremely talented person at the helm of the police department right now to carry on that tradition of excellence and I see nothing but good things in our future. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank you everyone, good night. Good night.